This week's crypto recap. Sam Bankman fried guilty on seven counts in the largest crypto trial to date. The SEC has now subpoenaed PayPal over its stablecoin and the much anticipated Solana Breakpoint Conference is now over. We're going to give you our highlights with Matt and Nick over in the Collective Shift weekly recap today. Actionable insights and a breakdown into the crypto market all in under 30 minutes just for you. As always, we'll start with the market update with Matt, followed by the SBF trial. That's the biggest news. But for now, market update. Matt, well, how's it going in the markets? Thanks, Leo. Crypto held on to its gains that we reported last week, which was very pleasing to see given how big of a move we had in late October. You know, moving on here into the first week into November, Bitcoin is up 2% for the past seven days. It is up to just, just shy of 35,000. And ETH actually touched 1900, but a price it had not been yet at a while, and it's up 6% for the week. And the big standout last week, which we will get to later, was definitely Solana's Sol token, which rallied to as high as $45 very briefly, which was above where it was uh, 12 months ago around the time of the FTX collapse, where many were questioning its future. So, yeah, a massive week for Solana. Looking forward to chatting about that later. Yeah, definitely. We do have some uh, great Solana news that we want to share with the team here. But yeah, it's been a crazy week of the market still. It's still going up a little bit, a little bit of green in the market. But uh, let's go on to the biggest news item of the entire week. And I think Nick is going to help us out here. It's the SBF and FTX trial. So many acronyms in crypto, my friends. <laughs> um, so this has been one of the largest crypto trials to date in, 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 the, in the world, right? So Nick, what's happening with SBF? What is the latest verdict we have? Yeah, Leon. So finally, we have some resolution after, you know, well, I think it's a few weeks now that the trial has kicked off. But yeah, Sam Bankman fraud has been found uh, guilty on about seven different uh, counts of fraud. So we finally have a resolution and it's a good one in that, in that we didn't have you know, any more prolonged FTX news or SBF news. We actually quite went quite uh, swimmingly, well, not for um, SBF himself. Uh, not for him. <laughs> really put up much of a fight um, from a lot of the reporting that I saw. It looked all one-way traffic and it was that way. It didn't take him long to reach the decision and we'll finally find uh, how long he's going to spend in prison in March next year. Hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, we this is the sort of thing we covered a couple of weeks ago as well. Um, now, I, I want to get the opinion of you guys here being the analysts over at Collective Shift. Do you think this news has been uh, has had a shock on the market itself? Uh, it's been pretty positive recently. We've had you know Solana going up so much. Uh, is it because F uh, Bitcoin is going up because of the ETF news? Do you, uh, has it actually impacted the market at all, Matt? What do you think? I think uh, yes, it would have had an impact if if there were any sort of you know big shocks or yeah news that the market sort of didn't really anticipate. But as Nick said. It, it's sort of gone. Uh, much of what happened in that trial was really just verifying what many of the public uh, who had been following this case were already sort of knew anyway. Uh, so in that respect, there wasn't really a, a market move. And I think that was, you know, justified given the nature of the case. So a lot of build up, anticipation for this, a lot of media coverage, particularly outside of the crypto space. But yeah, it looks like from the market standpoint, it's all behind us now and there shouldn't be any other bombshells to drop. Otherwise, obviously, we've got the FTX estate, which is selling tokens, but that's a known event and that is something that's being taken care of outside of, I suppose, the the legal actual trial of SPF. Yeah, thanks, Matt. I know there may be some, uh, we don't actually know if there will be some bombshells coming out from this, but it seems like we it is behind us. So maybe the whole crypto community can move forward on this. Um, let's 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 keep going, my friend Matt. Um, I want to talk to you about the Hong Kong. Um, there has been some recent news for ETF. I know ETF fever is going around the world so far. Um, America is, you know, having its two and four uh, with BlackRock for the ETF, but Hong Kong is coming back with its own ETF for retail investors. What's the update on that, Matt? Yeah, just a quick one here. This has come to start off the week actually here on a Monday and. Uh, we have reports from Bloomberg, so a pretty reputable source, that Hong Kong securities regulator is reportedly moving towards allowing retail investors to buy spot crypto ETFs or exchange-traded funds. Uh, you know, we know recently, I think we covered a few months ago, that Hong Kong 
was uh, sort of mandating a, a crypto spot exchange license, which was very encouraging, letting you know their residents buy and sell cryptocurrencies, uh, which you know had already it had been an optional sort of uh, regime in the past, but they you know it was a it was progress really to to sum it up. The big sort of takeaway here, I I suppose this would not be important in many other countries in the world, but I really felt this was necessary to highlight just because of how. Hong Kong is really one of the largest financial hubs in the world. You know, you've got London, New York, like Wall Street, Singapore, Hong Kong. They're probably, you know, four of the top ones, if not the four sort of top financial hubs in the world. Hence why it deserves some attention. If it was just another random country like okay, even Australia or, or Canada or something else, I don't think it'd be that important. But definitely wanted to highlight it here that we may be getting some spot crypto ETFs happening in Hong Kong pretty soon. Oh, Matt, I love it when you said random countries and Australia was the second one. So we're a bit random out there. We're not very good about crypto. But I totally understand what you're saying there. Some of the crypto hubs are in the major cities in the world, like London, uh, the UK, Europe, as well as uh, Hong Kong, of course. So it would be pretty significant if it was, of course, another spot Bitcoin ETF, which the US is battling with at the moment. But we'll keep an ear to the ground on this. It's just uh, just, uh, unconfirmed if it'll actually be going ahead. They're only considering it so far. So... We'll come back to this later. Now, Nick, I want to come over to you, my friend. Uh, there's been some recent news in the US, of course. Um, the regulation is still a battle between the SEC as well as uh, crypto um, companies. The SEC is now suing someone new. Who are they suing and why are they suing them? What's the what's the details? Uh, yeah, this one, not uh, entirely suing, but they've sort of subpoenaed. So they're sort of asking PayPal in regards to their PYUSD stablecoin to sort of, you know, answer the uh, a few issues related to the SEC. So they released, I think this this week, and they've come out and said that they're working with the SEC in regards to, you know, this potential issue that the, the SEC has raised. So it was a really big one just because PayPal was one of the biggest entrants into the market this year. And they actually launched saying that they felt comfortable with the regulatory environment, you know, to create their stablecoin finally. So this is kind of a really interesting one considering that was so confident and finally launched it. Now we're seeing the SEC potentially step in and maybe cause a fuss. And I'm just really taken aback because PYUSD is probably one of the, looks like one of the most uh, regulated and um, kind of consistent products out there. So it's really interesting seeing the SEC go after something like this and just kind of uh, maybe m- more pressure on the SEC and questions regarding what what you know who they're going after whether it's actually um the best use of their funds and time to be going after a stable coin and particularly one such as the paypal stable coin so i think it would be interesting to see what they actually say but yeah, very surprised to see them come out and go for paypal potentially yeah as you said before i want to double down on that there have been the more uh, transparent and regulated stable coin um because we did remember what happened with facebook as well they tried the libra dm a stable coin as well. And the US government was not happy with that. So what makes uh, PayPal that much different from Facebook? And are they actually going to get this off the ground? We have on the chart here, the PayPal USD stable coin itself. It does uh, seem to be holding its peg around the $1 mark. Let me zoom out here so we can all see. You can see there, it does have some little ticks going down all the way to 99.2 cents, um, but it's still being stable so far. So it seems pretty good. Now, this is just our Collective Shift platform. Just for anyone who's interested, you can go down, read our summary of the PayPal USD and any research we have on this token at the moment. So that's pretty awesome. Nick, thank you very much for that. I think stable coins are a narrative. We do try and cover a lot at Collective Shift here. But uh, uh, moving away from stable coins and coming onto assets that are pristine assets, Matt, you've got some great news with Bitcoin. What's up? What's happening with Bitcoin now? Yeah, so with the recent rally in Bitcoin's price really leading the market and you know surpassing thirty five thousand recently, uh, a lot of attention obviously on Bitcoin. Been getting some questions myself from people you know haven't spoken to in a while, checking in on on Bitcoin things like that. It seems like that maybe FOMO is starting to kick in also at the institutional level. Why is that the case? Well, we've actually you know got some signals here from Coin Shares, which you know does weekly sort of uh, updates of hey, what are all the Bitcoin investment products and crypto investment products around the world? They basically summarize the weekly flows in and out of those products and they summarize it in a weekly report. And 
yeah, it's really uh, telling a similar story in in their most recent report where uh, 326 million US dollars flowed into crypto investment products last week. Uh, and this was the most of any week since July 2022. Of that, you know, 326 million, around 90% was in relation to investment products that were covering only Bitcoin. So again, it's just likely driven coin shares sort of you know, speculate and, and we would agree is that it's really being driven by all of this anticipation surrounding the Bitcoin ETF. It's sort of the only news story that's getting any attention in the crypto space and it looks like even outside the crypto space too. So all of these sort of signals that institutional interest and institutional money is sort of coming into crypto. Um, we even are getting more signals coming in through the likes of the futures uh, sort of Bitcoin products, uh, just to really, you know, keep it as simple as possible. They're sort of the most, the, the most amount of money, you know, sloshing through the Bitcoin sort of options market. So the CME is the world's largest futures and, you know, sort of options exchange, you know, traditional finance, you know, mostly, obviously, mm. but they're actually sort of climbing the ranks in terms of their ranking um, in relation to Bitcoin sort of options. And they are now actually very close to being the number one exchange you know globally for bitcoin options trading so that's really snuck up under the radar and is yet you know yet another sort of you know metric or factor that's that's pointing and signaling uh to the market that hey the institutions are coming in yeah isn't that a funny statistic to actually observe in the market it's not a crypto native protocol mm-hmm. or platform like binance or coinspa- coinbase pro that are leading in the uh, options market for Bitcoin. It's actually a traditional finance platform. And if any, you need a, a signal to say traditional finance is coming. Hey, they're coming. If you can't tell, they're going up the ranks. But I mean, Matt, I mean, I'll come back to this. Why does it matter so much? We can see how fast the sentiment is changing with the positive price action now. Is this a sign that the uh, crowd is coming, do you think, to Bitcoin? The institutions are actually coming to Bitcoin? I think you can view view it like that, but t- more so for the coin shares. So that for, more so for that first point about the the inflows into sort of Bitcoin investment products, because again, these these products aren't you know necessarily you know the most easy or direct way to get access or exposure to Bitcoin. And for many other countries outside of the US, that like this is a, a perfectly normal way to get exposure to Bitcoin. But for certain entities in the US, this is still from my understanding, not really uh, a possibility in terms of, you know, getting getting access to Bitcoin. So let's just say that a spot ETF is approved in the US, you know, with already such a strong signal of demand from, you know, non-US institutions, I would assume, uh, you would have to sort of then follow on to, you know, out to a situation where US institutions would be happy to, you know, buy into a, a spot ETF, not to mention all of the US sort of, you know, retail participants as well, who, you know, are investing in ETFs as has been the case over the last sort of 10 to 15 years as this very, well, this acronym has now become a lot more well known. So look, Bitcoin, as I said, even last week, it has changed a ton. You know, it's worth pointing out 15 year anniversary of Bitcoin's white paper was celebrated last week, October 31st on Halloween. Uh, and now, 15 years later, we're talking about the biggest institutions in the world sort of you know, getting exposure to Bitcoin. So come a long way and who knows what the next 15 years holds. Hey? <laughs> yeah, that's right. And the blockchain will just keep ticking along if the institutions will come here or not. Um, it's good to know. Bitcoin, happy birthday, my friend. Uh, I, 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 you're in my portfolio, so it's good to have you. <laughs> um, all right, let's move on, my friends. Nick, uh, Nick and myself, we are big proponents of the Solana ecosystem. Now, Solana did have one of its biggest conferences in uh, Amsterdam, I think it was, called Breakpoint. Now, we're going to just give you our highlights from this, um, look at some specific items that I thought is worth mentioning. Um, Nick, I'll let you take it away first. What did you notice or what, what's, the, uh, what's the ecosystem uh, doing after the Solana Breakpoint? Yeah, thanks, Leon. It was really good timing, I, I guess, for Solana, considering that it's hit, I think, 80% highs in the last three weeks. I think it's plus 300% new to date. Um, and it is, uh, I think, at its highest point since August 2022. So, uh, you know, a, a lot there for Solana. And it's kind of will we'll come up and in a really interesting time. 
The one that I was looking forward to was Fire Dancer, which is a major update to Solana. It's probably one of the most influential and important changes to Solana that's going to be coming up, perhaps even since it really first launched or sort of changed the way it dealt with how people interact with Solana when they pay fees or whatnot. But at a high level, Solana is essentially just going to be this new validator client, you know, which helps process transactions on the network. Um, and it's kind of a rewrite of it completely. So they're sort of saying that this is what Solana would have built if, uh, you know, Solana had waited two years, for example, to launch. So they launched with the first validator, which was kind of a, a patchy job. He would, I think that's what he said in his uh, a state of the market address. Yeah. And so essentially this is just a complete rewrite. It's a new validator client. So it is really important to facilitating uh, kind of the durability of Solana, making sure it stays up, it stays robust, um, improves transaction speeds, also would lower the cost of, I guess, being a validator or running a node on Solana. So it does you know, a lot, and we're sort of expecting it to hit mainnet in about the first half of next year. It just entered testnet at the conference, and then it's aiming for a full-fledged launch at the end of 2024. So what's now is kind of this half-half job of what's currently on Solana and half of this new product. And then we're going to see like a full rollout towards the end of next year. Yeah, they did say it was testnet and it's going pretty well so far. And they did mention another validator client as well uh, that's being in the works, not by the same Fire Dancer team over at Jump Crypto, by another one. But this is all great. This is all good news, Nick. Um, so I'll, I'll share what, one thing I saw as well that I thought was worth highlighting. And then we can go. I think you had something on Jito Labs as well. So what I saw just first thing was it's a great turnout, right? There were so many people at the conference. I wasn't there myself, but I am in some communities that were there. One thing that really stood out was GameShift Beta. And this is um, a kind of new development. Uh, Solana is very big on gaming in itself because of the low transaction fee and the low cost and the and the, the speed at which you can actually transact. So it's just a way for game developers to really build out games without actually the need for any blockchain education, which is a massive barrier to game developers. So it's a huge advantage if it's actually realized. There is a small caveat though, is that they also have a, a marketplace that they want to do for game shift uh, for game shift beta. It's actually denominated in fiat currencies. There's no crypto, no Solana, no USDC, only Australian dollars or US dollars. That is also a very big advantage over more other marketplaces. People want to play games. They want to know how much something costs in dollars. They don't have to worry about getting a Solana wallet address. So game shift beta, I'm looking forward to it. Nick, what are any other highlights you had? Yeah, the other main highlight for me was uh, Gito Labs, which is a uh, sort of a company that is building out uh, staking products for Solana. So they're trying to really maximize the amount of yield you can get from staking your your soul. So there's something um, on you know on the blockchain when you actually transact. Sometimes you don't actually get the best prices, and you sort of leak value. It's something called MEV, which to, you don't really need to get into the technicals, but as I said, it's just about leaking value. You don't really get the full amount of, you know, bang for your buck, essentially. And then there's these other crafty actors who will come out and extract that value. So this is what Gito Labs is trying to do. They're trying to create robust solutions to stake your Solana that can also help, um, I guess, decentralize the network by having more staking, not just with a few main players. And so their sort of software helps to increase the yield because they're able to essentially extract all this leaked value and then return that uh, to uh, Sol via their sort of Gito Sol. So it's where you get an added yield um, from something that's actually quite tangible. They're extracting value and they're putting it through you know, increased yields. Um, I think they may actually uh, drop a token, it looks like. They've got an ongoing rewards program and I'm really uh, anticipating a potential Gito Sol token because uh, they also just announced their Gito fake net which is this kind of only one solution to help you stake on Solana. So a lot there, and it's probably one of the teams that I really look forward to. I would encourage everyone to check out that presentation. It was really engaging. Uh, yeah, a lot to like though from the Solana teams. Yeah, Nick, uh, I am actually staking Gito Sol myself, and I've seen you can go log in and you can have a look at your points balance and see what your global rank is. So if, if you're looking for a new Solana staking, uh, liquid staking solution, then might as well try our Gito Sol just a little bit and see if you can get a token out of it. Maybe we'll update our airdrops guides. Guys, 
Um, so let me share my screen as well here. I just wanted to give you some transparency over at Collective Shift. We do try and keep things, uh, you know, as, as transparent as we can all the time. And so I just want to tell you guys uh, in the audience uh, listening at home as well, this is the team's holdings over at Collective Shift. You don't need to be an account holder to go and see this. You can see what, what tokens we do hold. So Ben doesn't hold any Solana, but Matt Williamson does hold some Solana. Nick holds some Solana. And over down here, I also earn some Solana as well as uh, David Bowen as well and some Solana. So we do like Solana, but that's not because we're shilling it, because we see some potential in it ourselves. Um, and with that being said, just a bit of transparency there for you. I've got two more things, two more takeaways that I wanted to share, maybe even three. The first thing was Star Atlas uh, in conjunction with Gameship Beta. Um, according to the transparency page, as well as me, I do own some Star Atlas NFT. So I am slightly biased here, but I loved it. They had the best presentation at, at um, the Solana conference. The UE5 game is going pretty well. You can check out the graphics as well as Starbase, which is their web-based platform. But that's a game. Okay, I want to go over to the more in infrastructure building of the actual blockchain. The first thing was an airdrop was actually announced for Pith Network. Pith Network is one of the largest oracles in crypto. It's uh, next to the chain link, if you know what the oracle system is. It's basically how you know what something is worth or what pricing is worth. So a whole bunch of information transacting on chain. So it's wide, it's the biggest airdrop because the the um, the actual Oracle is used by a whole bunch of different protocols and a whole bunch of different chains. So if you have a Solana wallet, you may have an airdrop. If you have a uh, an EVM wallet, Ethereum, or if you have a MetaMask wallet, or if you have any layer two wallets, you may be eligible for this airdrop. So please go and check the airdrops page for the Pith Network. And lastly, um, uh, a little bit in conjunction with the um, Solana conference is the Hyperdrive Hackathon. The Hyperdrive Hackathon just announced their winners after the Breakpoint conference. Good timing, I would say. Um, this, this Hackathon, Solana is very famous for the hackathons. They had 9,000 people and they had 700 projects come out from it. But I want to keep in mind that some of these projects are just experimentations, okay? They're just fledgling protocols. They haven't even got a good website, good team behind them. They're just starting out. They may get some prize money and then they go and build something crazy from that. Now, the grand prize winner, I'll let you know, is called Fluxbot. They won $50,000. It's an AI chatbot in kind of Telegram. Think about it like this. You can have a chat going and that chat is your Solana wallet. You can go and tell it to go and buy something using a chat function. You can go and tell it to sell something using a chat function. It's got 10 different languages. Think how many people we are actually leaving out of crypto if they cannot use the app because they don't have the language. Now this chatbot helps you. Um, so it's pretty interesting, I would say. There's lots of other projects that have won some extra um, extra um, prizes in the Solana conference, but I'm gonna leave it there, my friends. I think that's something I'm gonna be looking at, look at all the winners, all the uh, people who got nominations and just see if there's any alpha in there for the members out there. And lastly, let's go into the uh, second last bit of our uh, podcast where we talk about things we look forward to. I'll take this as well. We, the team, will be at the Australian Crypto Conference happening over in Melbourne. We want you to come see us, come and say hi, come and talk about your crypto journey with us because we are here to help you in your crypto journey. We've got a little section in the networking lounge. So we have one hour where you'll be able to come and chat with us. Ben is hosting, I think, two panels. And Matt and Nick, as well as I, will be having some workshops. So come and chat to us. Come and get involved in the crypto uh, ecosystem. We have free tickets for our members. If you don't have one already, make sure you reach out to the Collective Shift team and we'll get you a free ticket. That's it for the conference. We'll see you there. Um, that's happening in Melbourne, I think, uh, in about uh, three or four days from now. Now, rapid fire. Matt, Nick, what in the market have you been appreciating? Let us know. Matt, what's happening? Okay, underrated for me this week is NFTs. Uh, might not have heard that acronym in a while. Uh, featuring on the Simpsons' uh, most recent, that's a name you might not have also heard in a while, the Simpsons' Halloween episode. So it was a Treehouse of Horror episode for those familiar with uh, the Simpson Simpsons. They do it every year. And yeah, we have, as is expected with the Simpsons writers, going quite deep with their sort of uh, references to different NFTs um, and just various different things about blockchain uh, and cryptocurrencies. So uh, yeah, that was something that, you know, was quite surprising to see, I suppose, NFTs re-emerge in popular culture. 
haven't uh, haven't actually watched it myself, but my understanding is they sort of take the Mickey out of NFTs as is sort of expected after its rise and fall in 2022 in particular, and quite a quite <laughs> rather quiet year in 2023. Uh, and then just lastly, unsurprisingly, as is always the case, we saw a someone out there create a Simpsons uh, Springfield Punks collection, uh, which is, yeah, done 760 ETH worth of volume today oh after the episode was released. Uh, and that is, well, I guess it's not a scam, but it's, uh, I, I don't know, it's an illegitimate sort of project. So definitely, you know, strongly advise against anyone even you know looking at it but i think it's just it almost reminds me a lot of the nft bull market when that sort of thing happened a few times a day it seems like so you know a little bit of nostalgia there for nft dgens but uh yeah it was uh, a rather yeah a rather surprising thing underrated for me yeah my god mass the bad and good thing about an open and free network is that it's an open and free network we can't stop these guys from creating this extra crappy token but hey if they're having fun that's that's what matters right uh nick my friend what did you appreciate or underappreciate in the market today uh, i'll go definitely underappreciating uh, i guess bitcoin's changing narrative in terms of its energy consumption it's something that i've noticed a lot uh, to start off the year and just something that i continually see each week we're seeing new innovations in i guess testing bitcoin mining in different ways um to really flip the switch on that environment environmental uh kind of narrative which was really strong in the last bull market uh you know, it's strong so much of the theorem you know is now a proof of stake network and a lot of uh blockchains now are really moving away from proof of work because of that connotation uh but i think there was here with a public miner i think it is uh, marathon digital if i remember correctly that they're piloting um, a mining project in utah sort of to extract uh landfill waste and sort of turn that into effective bitcoins by mining so we're seeing a few other examples of this changing narrative and if different um, i guess examples of how you can flip the switch on this environmental narrative and slowly by slowly i'm actually reading a lot of academic journals which are showing the support that bitcoin can actually do to strengthen the electrical grid and kind of actually help offset the network so it's a big narrative that i'm only anticipating to see more of next year and Love to see more of these projects that potentially aren't getting the uh, attention that they deserve, but they're quietly, you know, coming out and trying to flip the switch on this environmental narrative. Yeah, the narratives in the crypto space as well as the macro space does change quite frequently because humans, you know, change their mind based on the circumstances sometimes. But the good thing about Bitcoin is that it doesn't lie. The data doesn't lie. You can actually go and have a look. Um, so this is something as well we'll keep an eye on. Nick, thank you very much for um, uh, letting us know. And I think my last thing that I uh, underappreciated in the market was there has been another security incident. Now, I always talk about security because I am very, uh, I want to say, good with my security and I want you guys to have good security as well. But this latest incident just you know, highlights it again. It's Ledger Live. Everyone in crypto, if you've got enough crypto, you know about Ledger. Um, so this is a new application that actually snuck into the Microsoft application store called Ledger Live Web 3. Um, and it's not the first time this has happened either. This time they actually managed to siphon off $500,000, nearly half a million dollars of customer funds because people connected it and thought it was a legitimate Ledger device software. So it's just a reminder that being your own bank is actually very hard, guys. Even if you try to do the right thing sometimes, self custodying yourself, People out there will try and take your money from it. Either it's a central bank or either it's a common thief. You just have to be very, very careful, okay? And I'll leave it there. Another security tip. We've got our security center in the Collective Shift platform. Come and have a look. That's a wrap for this week, my friends. If you're looking for more insights, please check out the revamped Weekly Shift newsletter. It provides free weekly insights as well as every Friday you get some tidbits on top of it. Subscribe at collectiveshift.io forward slash newsletter. That's collectiveshift.io. Io forward slash newsletter. We will see you next week. Bye for now.